Video game journalists. Inscrutable folk, but in many ways we should be thanking them because every now and then they review a game so poorly that it causes us gamers who are usually fighting amongst ourselves to call a brief truce, congregate around the dislike button and fight back against a common enemy. And with IGN being the poster child for bad video game journalism, I thought I'd create this list of the top 10 most disliked IGN reviews of all time. Because what brings gamers together more than pure, unbridled hate? So, coming in at number 10, we have their review of Call of Duty Black Ops 3 from 2015, sitting at a respectable 19,000 dislikes. Why? Well, IGN once again gave a Call of Duty game a stupidly high score of 9.2 out of 10, with zero cons. If it has no cons, why not give it a 10 then? See, not only do we get angry when IGN rate a game too low, we get just as angry when they rate a game too high, especially when that game is from a franchise like Call of Duty, which releases the same boring game year after year and IGN keeps giving them 9s out of 10s. And what really pisses on our chips is when they rate games that are clearly more innovative, original, with better mechanics, graphics and gameplay lower than the latest Call of Duty game. So keep this score in mind as we move on down the list. At number 9, we have their Sonic Unleashed review from 2008, with 20,000 dislikes. The reviewer basically tears the game to shreds. There's one thing you should know about Sonic Unleashed before spending your hard-earned money on it. It's a big piece of garbage. Big piece of garbage. Indeed, it's games like this that make reviewers rethink their lives. Now, I have a theory when it comes to Sonic games. Someone at Sega hates the Hedgehog with all his might, and he's going about trying to sabotage the franchise with these awful games. Yet he still ends up somehow giving the game a 4.5. He claims the jump button is unresponsive, then proceeds to jump over the boost ramp to his death. The jump button can be fatally unresponsive at times, and it's just a lot of trial and error gameplay that can get a little bit repetitive after a while. And his hot take on why he shouldn't have to upgrade Sonic speed is so fresh. I mean really, do I need to pay to upgrade Sonic speed? Shouldn't Sonic be as fast as he can be from the get-go? Isn't that the reason why I bought a Sonic game in the first place? Oh, and you can cleanse people's souls by taking pictures of them. I'm not even joking about that. In the world of video games, why would taking a picture to cleanse someone's soul be so far-fetched? I mean, he knows he's playing a game in which he's controlling an anthropomorphic werewolf hedgehog, doesn't he? But at the end of the day, by 2008 standards, Sonic Unleashed wasn't that bad, and gamers were just annoyed at another IGN reviewer haphazardly reviewing a game they clearly had no interest in. Sitting at a cosy 21,000 dislikes, their 2016 review of Uncharted 4 is at number 8. So, what were we angry about this time? Though it's let down by a lack of imagination and some self-indulgence, especially in a third act that drags on far too long. A 9 out of 10. The dreaded, bloated third act. You know a game's gonna be good when IGN give it a 9 out of 10, and we still come after them with pitchforks. <laughs> oh, I love us. But IGN have to meet us halfway. They can't give Black Ops 3 a 9.2 no cons and Uncharted 4 a 9, calling its third act bloated and saying it has a curious lack of imagination when the entirety of Black Ops 3 is a bloated third act. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition slashes its way into our number 7 slot with 24,000 dislikes. Now, this review has all the hallmarks of a classic bad IGM review. Firstly, the review contains a massive spoiler where they show, without warning, a late game unlockable character in the menu screen which would spoil the whole first half of the game. Now, you'd think IGM would take the video down, edit out the spoiler and re-upload it, but instead they decided to leave this pinned comment in the comment section. Lazy bastards. Next, the reviewer goes on to call Melia, one of the weaker characters from the main campaign, a sentiment Xenoblade fans strongly disagree with, and then calls the character Dunban, Duncan. This time, however, they did edit out the mistake. 
but even in the re-edit, he still pronounces the name wrong, with a horrendous drop in audio quality, which sounds like he did the voice edits on one of these. PGs, the story goes to some really, really weird places that are as confusing as they are preposterous. The core Xenoblade experience remains intact here, lovable meathead Ryan, or the stoic and inscrutable Dunbon. They call Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition the best version of Xenoblade Chronicles we've ever had, giving it an 8 out of 10 which is a lower score than they gave the original release and 3DS port. Work that one out. In at number 6 is their Shin Megami Tensei 5 review with 36,000 dislikes, and IGN managed to piss everyone off within the first 6 seconds of the review. Shin Megami Tensei 5 feels like the edgier, less sociable younger brother of Persona 5. The reviewer complains about how certain aspects of the game are not the same as a Persona game, which to Shin Megami Tensei fans is the entire point. It's not so much a standalone review of Shin Megami Tensei 5, but more a video comparing two different series and taking marks off of one game because it's not like the other. Where SMT5 consistently fell short for me as a massive Persona fan though, was the writing. It takes upwards of 20 hours to find any personal motivation beyond survival and figuring out what's going on, in contrast to Persona 5, which makes things personal right away. I just couldn't shake the feeling that this was Persona without the heart. Without the unforgettable companion characters, the potent personal story, the incredible soundtrack, and the jaw-dropping twists and turns. Giving the game an 8, with the only negatives being that it's not like Persona, is mental, and fans of the Shin Megami Tensei series were absolutely right to call this one out. Things are hotting up now! Doom 2016 blasts its way in at number 5 with a healthy 42,000 dislikes. He starts waffling on about how Doom 2016 feels too Doom. For some, this is exactly what Doom should be because it resembles the 1993 game of the same name. But with all due respect, those are desperately low expectations. But it doesn't really distinguish itself by recreating 25 year old gameplay. 2 minutes and 15 seconds is all the time he gives to reviewing Doom's main campaign before moving on to the multiplayer, which he also hates. Fixed power up placement and shortcuts give experienced players who know the map an advantage. No, really? Do you mean to tell me that if players learn the maps and best weapon locations, they have an advantage? This makes the decision to restrict access to weapons and include a Call of Duty style leveling system that much stranger, because it gives experienced players another leg up with access to better weapons and more powerful demon runes. So experienced players that put more time and effort into the multiplayer get access to better weapons and items? You're blowing my mind IGN, blowing my mind! So what was the verdict on one of the best shooters to have come out in the last 15 years? A 7.1 out of 10. It still meets the high bar Call of Duty fans expect. Amazingly, we have a tie at our number 4 spot between two different Pokemon game reviews. Pokemon Alpha Sapphire Omega Ruby and Pokemon Sword and Shield both on 45,000 dislikes. And believe it or not, Sapphire Ruby is probably the most infamous review on this list because it gave birth to the most popular IGN meme, Too Much Water. It's not a new complaint, but the Hoenn region is still imbalanced type-wise, heavily favoring water Pokemon. It's especially noticeable in Alpha Sapphire since the villainous Team Aqua uses a lot of water types. It just feels like there are water Pokemon in nearly every battle and I have an overleveled Pikachu to show for it. You also have to navigate many bodies of water, which makes much of the late game incredibly tedious. Other than saying the game is TOO MUCH WATER and too many hidden moves, she doesn't seem to have anything else negative to say about the remaster. And I guess Pokemon fans, as understanding and compassionate as they may be, were just perplexed as to why having TOO MUCH WATER would have such a heavy effect on the overall rating of the game, which the reviewer gives a 7.8. So politely picking up their pitchforks, they completely annihilated the review and created a meme so powerful, it now completely embodies the entire bad video game journalism topic. 
Right, on to Sword and Shield. Same nostalgic charm, but it doesn't fall victim to getting stuck in the past. It streamlines and fixes many of the series' long-running problems, from excessive tutorials to the tedium of navigating random encounters. Simply put, Sword and Shield are the best Pokemon games I have ever played, and I've played them all. Big words from IGN there. It seems that some people like this game, and some people think it's an absolute underwhelming letdown. But it's no question that everyone was expecting the second Pokemon game on a home console to look much better than it did, and include all pre-existing Pokemon, which it didn't, causing the whole Game Freak Lied controversy. When they said the reason why they're not including all pre-existing Pokemon was because they were remaking character models and their animations, not just porting them over from older games. Then a Reddit post surfaced showing allegedly leaked data mined comparisons of Sword and Shield's character models alongside character models from older games that seemed to completely contradict what Game Freak had previously said, aka Game Freak lied. So I think we're not just seeing people disagreeing with IGN's stupidly high score for another Pokemon game, but also protest dislikes after feeling they had been lied to by the developers and IGN hilariously getting caught in the crossfire. Gotta love it. Cruising its way into our number three slot is their review of Days Gone from 2019 with 50,000 dislikes. What did IGN do now? Well, first off, this is the same reviewer that gave Uncharted 4, with its bloated third act, a 9. So, she was already on the Sony fanboy's naughty dog list. And boy howdy, she pulled no punches here, giving Days Gone a 6.5 calling it bloated as well. Days Gone ultimately feels bloated, like a movie that goes on for an hour longer than it needs to or should have. There's definitely a good game in here somewhere. You can feel it in the crunchy combat and when running from an enormous freaker horde. Some fine tuning and editing could have removed the tedium and highlighted what makes this game unique and interesting, but Days Gone rides strictly down the middle of the dusty road and never finds its rhythm. Now the general consensus is that the game is pretty good, and I think gamers felt the 6.5 was unjustified and found some of the reviewers' criticisms disingenuous. Like here, for instance, when she criticizes the bad writing. Which Days Gone insists on telling largely through tedious, barely interactive flashbacks of him and his wife. The dialogue's uh, pretty bad. But only if you promise to ride me as much as you ride your bike. On the face of it, you'd think the reviewer has a point. Out of context, that line does seem really cringy. But earlier on in the game, Deacon's wife Sarah specifically asked Deacon not to say that line at their wedding, only to surprise him by saying it herself. The reviewer also hits us with this absolute peach. Deacon can also unlock a slow-mo ability early on, which makes no sense for a biker, but it allows you to relieve the pressure for a moment if you get overwhelmed. It's a game with guns. What on earth is she blathering about? Why should riding a bike stop us from having a slow motion ability in our zombie shooting game? Because Days Gone's missions suffer from repetition across the board. Oh, what's that IGN? You don't like repetitive missions? Then why did you give the 888th Assassin's Creed game a 9.2 only six months earlier? Another inconsistent IGN review, coupled with pissing off every Sony fanboy again, is why this review took the number three slot. Unbelievably, at number two, we have a three-way tie. Alien Isolation, Death Stranding, and SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated reviews all managed to achieve 51,000 dislikes each, and all three games couldn't be more different from one another, which just showcases IGN's remarkable ability to enrage gamers regardless of what types of games they review. At this point, it actually starts to become impressive. When I began researching for this video, watching one bad IGM review after the other, I looked a lot like this. But by the time I got to the end, on finding out that they'd managed to reach 51,000 dislikes on three separate occasions, the agony and pure frustration started to melt away, replaced by amazement and a cheerful bubbly, light-hearted sense of childlike wonder. So, 
How did IGN manage to rack up 153,000 dislikes across three reviews? Well, a good start would be giving Alien Isolation a 5.9 out of 10. But when the genuine scares of being hunted by an unstoppable predator are so diluted by repetition and padding, Isolation's epic length really does work against it. Someday, someone is going to make an incredible Alien video game that checks every box. But sadly, Isolation is not it. Needless to say, gamers were outraged, and judging by the comment section, still are. And rightly so. It's one of the most atmospheric, tense, faithful to its source material horror games ever made. Even eight years after its release, it's still better than most, if not all, of the crappy horror shovelware games you'll come across today and it didn't help that IGN gave Goat Simulator an 8 out of 10 six months earlier. One of the most laughable criticisms the reviewer makes is how he was killed even though he was motionless and out of sight. Fright dissolved into frustration as I got killed from behind for the umpteenth time even as I was crouched motionless and out of sight in an air duct. But leaves out the fact that he was holding the motion sensor that alerts aliens to your position which the game makes perfectly clear, and it's just another case of IGN getting the completely wrong person for the job. A mistake they also made with their review of Death Stranding, which they gave a 6.8. Certain landmark games in recent years, like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Red Dead Redemption 2, have managed to successfully tread the line between the rigidity of realism and the exhilaration of pure escapism. Death Stranding possesses similarly lofty ambitions, inventive ideas, and a sprawling spectacular map, but it's all been saddled on a backbone made of repetitive mission design and arduous traversal that simply can't support its weight over the full course of the journey. This review apparently isn't for everyone. Perfectly balanced. Just as the game isn't for everyone, and it's definitely a game you have to be in the right mood and frame of mind to play which if you are, there's no doubt you'll find the 6.8 score absolutely ridiculous. And even if the game's not for you, I'm sure you'd still be able to appreciate that Death Stranding is a truly unique AAA one-off experience from one of gaming's living legends, Hideo Kojima. And lest we forget, in the very same month, in the very same year, they gave Pokemon Sword and Shield a 9.3 out of 10. Okay, last game in this three-way tie. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. How is it even possible to get 51,000 dislikes on your review of a remake of a 17-year-old mediocre SpongeBob SquarePants platformer that PS2 kids remember fondly? <gasps> Well, from what I can tell, his main problem with the game is that it feels like a remake of a 17-year-old mediocre SpongeBob SquarePants platformer that PS2 kids remember fondly, and that it doesn't feel as good as the Crash and Spyro remakes. It's accompanied by some imaginative improvements, but those few bright spots aren't enough to bring Battle for Bikini Bottom's passable but simplistic gameplay up to the standard of a 2020 platformer let alone impressive recent remakes like the Spyro Reignited Trilogy. All three playable characters, Spongebob, Sandy, and Patrick, have the same repetitive few lines of dialogue that they bleed out after finding collectibles, grabbing health, or hitting enemies. I feel like a new sponge. Oh, sparkly. I love opening presents. By the 30th time I heard them, I just wanted to stop playing. He then goes on to call the remake of a 17-year-old mediocre SpongeBob SquarePants platformer that PS2 kids remember fondly. Get this, too kid-friendly. Battle for Bikini Bottom is an incredibly easy platformer with only a few truly challenging sections thrown in. The difficulty jump in levels like SpongeBob's Dream is often fun, but there's such whiplash from the rest of the adventure. And when they're done, the challenge reverts to being simplistic and kid-friendly for its final few challenges. Ultimately, us gamers are always happy when a game from our childhood gets a good remake which is what Rehydrated is. Okay, it doesn't add any bells and whistles, but what did the reviewer expect them to do with Battle for Bikini Bottom? Add a Battle Royale mode? And the gamers that enjoyed this game as kids, who probably just wanted to take a load off and rekindle their youth for a few hours, didn't appreciate another disinterested, monotone IGN review raining on their parade.
<laughs> it's the big one. The Last of Us Part 2 is the most disliked IGM review of all time, coming in at nearly double that of our number two games, a whopping 91,000 dislikes. Spoiler alert, covering the build up and leaks and the controversy around this game is another video entirely, but let me just cover the main kick in the balls. The first game is one of the most loved and critically acclaimed games of all time, no question. Not just for its graphics and gameplay, but for its storytelling, dialogue and the relationship that develops between the two main characters, Joel and Ellie. And as the credits rolled on the first game, the seven year long wait for the sequel began. Then about a month prior to The Last of Us 2's release came the leaks, with one leak towering above the rest. The leak was a cutscene of Joel, the main character from The Last of Us, getting his head caved in by an athletic woman with a golf club. Needless to say, fans of the series were stunned. Not only did they have to deal with the main character of their favourite game getting killed off, but they then had to continue playing the game as the random chick that killed him. And so when IGN said this, But while part two is a thrilling adventure, it still makes time for a stunning, nuanced exploration of the strength and fragility of the human spirit. The PlayStation 4 has one of its finest exclusives in one of the generation's best games. Personally, I only liked the first game. I mean, it was brilliant, don't get me wrong. No need to dislike this video. <laughs> Wouldn't that be ironic? But once I finished it, I didn't feel the need to ever play it again. We're not talking about beautiful Joe here, let's be real. And whether or not The Last of Us Part 2 deserves to be the main focus of the most disliked IGN review of all time is up for debate. But what's not up for debate is that IGN continue to be the worst source of video game reviews on the internet. And long may they reign. Thank you all for watching. I've been the Tominator. Subscribe if you want to see more gaming content like this and let me know what IGM review pissed you off the most in the comments. For me, it's Greg Miller's review of Zombie U. But for now, Zombie U is a one-dimensional whack-a-mole title with some clever ideas that never really come together. Which lives in my head rent-free. Anyway, take it easy and remember, never add too much water. And as always, hasta la vista, baby.